Hello, thank you for having me today. Sorry that I'm not speaking live. Um, my name is Amy Hinsley and I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. I'm part of the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit or WAL crew. I'm also co-chair of the IUCN SSC Orchid Specialist Group uh, as of about three weeks ago, but I've been working on orchid trade for my whole career. So today I'm going to give you an overview of orchid trade, some of the different things we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about conservation of traded species, and uh, give you a few examples of why people trade orchids and what we need to be to be um, finding out about those people um, in order to plan conservation more efficiently. So the key message today is about that diversity, about how orchid trade is not just one thing, it's as diverse as the orchid family itself. And, um, and that diversity and the complexities within different parts of the orchid trade are things that um, that have to be considered in, in all aspects of their conservation. And if you want to know more about this, this is a, a 20 minute talk, but if you want to know more about it after this, then a few members of the IUCN SSC Orchid Specialist Group's Global Trade Programme, uh, which we definitely need a catchier name for, um, we all got together a few years ago to write this review paper, which is in Bot J. Linsock, and it's open access. And it's lots of people from um, different uh, fields and also working in different regions and on different types of trade. So it's it's quite a good overview of different types of trade. So please do check that out if you're interested in orchid trade. So the kind of the kinds of diversity I'm going to talk about today um, are in terms of use type. So orchids are used for lots and lots of different reasons. Some of them are very well known, some of them are not. But for that, we kind of need to be thinking about why are the consumers actually buying this product at this time? What is their motivation for, be, for buying that product? Because that can tell us more about the trade itself. It can tell us more about um, how demand might change, uh, whether people might be uh, willing to buy more sustainable products, for example. Talking of sustainability, we also need to be thinking about the source of plants. Something might be wild or it might be farmed. It could be somewhere in the middle. Um, for example, uh, an artificially propagated plant that is from wild mother stock might be technically artificially propagated, but legally in terms of definitions of artificially propagated, it might not yet fit that definition. So it's not, you know, uh, it's not binary there. You also have um, legality, which is, is really linked to the source of plants. So often trade in wild plants might be illegal if you don't have the right permissions to do so. Trade in artificially propagated plants might often be legal, but that's not always the case. And there's this grey area in the middle as well. And finally, diversity in terms of species involved. I'll get to that kind of closer to the end about how we actually don't really know very much about the species involved. I'm going to start with legality. So orchids make up the majority of all species listed on the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or CITES, uh, on the appendices of CITES. And um, this chart here is from that review paper I just mentioned, and it shows the, the two kind of main appendices of CITES, Appendix 1, species in Appendix 1 are highly threatened by trade and you cannot trade any wild specimen from an Appendix 1 species commercially it's it's there's a trade ban on that and as you can see orchids make up around 11 percent of appendix one so that's mainly Paphiopedilum and Phragmopedium um species but also lots of lots of others as well um and appendix two in appendix two you can trade wild specimens of these species but you have to have a permit to do so and you have to prove that the trade is not detrimental to wild populations of the species I should say that CITES, uh, as is in its name, covers just international trade. So there will be different domestic legislation covering orchid trade in different countries. But if you if you really look at CITES as a convention of 35,000 species, that you know the vast majority of those species are orchids. So if you ever go to a CITES meeting, they will tend to just be talking about elephants and rhinos for several days at a time. But it's it's actually really an orchid convention if you think about it in terms of numbers. But this kind of brings in an interesting legality uh, consideration in terms of trade of wild orchids. So often you can tell if um, an internationally traded orchid is legal or illegal based on um, whether it has permits or whether it's in Appendix 1 and therefore shouldn't be being traded at all. 
And there is a really well developed legal trade in artificially propagated cultivated plants um, that operates over the, the whole world. People love orchids as an ornamental plant um, in lots of different countries. There are also other um, other types of trade where uh, artificially propagated plants are um, traded legally. For example, um, trade for uh, vanilla. Um, that's that's a legal trade and it's one that operates on a really large scale. But um, these artificially propagated plants are traded globally. Mainly um, hybrids are produced on a, a mass kind of market basis, but also artificially propagated species orchids are also traded widely. But you can also get this illegal trade in wild plants, which is what I've worked a lot on. So um, illegal trade can operate actually really, really openly. This picture in the bottom left is from Vietnam from a student, an MSc student, Leanne Bullo, who I worked with. She took this picture of um, just mounds and mounds of wild orchids for sale in Vietnam just on the street and this has been the case in lots of places that I've worked you kind of walk around you can very easily find wild harvested orchids and I'm saying illegal trade in wild plants they they are often being illegally traded but as as I mentioned if they're being traded on a domestic scale it can sometimes be really hard to tell whether something's legal or illegal because it really does depend on the domestic legislation of that country which can also be sometimes quite difficult to find out um, but also they're, they're widely traded and very openly traded online. These are some examples that I've been taking over the years from various websites. The one on the top left and top right, they're both from eBay. And as you can see on the left there, this even lists a wild collected orchid in the description of the, the item for sale. And this is being sold internationally from Indonesia um, and it was not being sold with CITES permits and it was a, a slipper orchid as well. So it was um, an appendix one plant anyway. So that wild collected orchid should not have been traded internationally. But um, yeah, as you can see, people didn't try and hide it at all. The one in the middle is, is a screenshot from Instagram. So orchid trade, illegal orchid trade, wild orchid trade is really happening everywhere. But orchid trade is a really big business. So this graph is from CITES trade data. This is all legal trade. And this is from um, that review paper again. We looked at orchid trade in the CITES trade data over a 10 year period. And there were over a billion orchid plants traded over this 10 year period. And 99% of them were artificially propagated. You can see still that there, there is legal trade in wild harvested plants, that gray line at the bottom of the graph. Um, but it never gets up anywhere near the, um, the, the volume of trade in artificially propagated plants. And it's, it's kind of decreasing over time as well, apart from this little spike towards the end of that 10 year period. So now I'm just going to move on to talk about some, some of the more interesting stuff, really, some of the um, uses of orchids. So orchids are used for lots of different reasons. I'm going to highlight food, first of all. We all know about vanilla. I've already mentioned vanilla, probably um, the most widely traded uh, food orchid. But um, <clears throat> but this is an example of another type of orchid being used for food. These are terrestrial orchids harvested in places like Turkey, Greece and also neighbouring countries. And you can see on the left, these are some of the species that are harvested and they're dug up and their underground tubers are ground to produce a powder that's called salep. Salep is uh, then used to make a hot drink in the winter. In the in the summer, it's used to make this ice cream that's called marashed on Dama. All of these pictures are taken, by the way, um, when I was visiting Suzanne Masters, who's in this middle photo on the left, uh, during her PhD research on Salep. So um, I just wanted to highlight her there because I wouldn't have known so much about Salep if it hadn't have been for her. Uh, but you can see the ice cream. This guy is holding it on the end of the, uh, this, this pole. It's very thick. It gets the texture from the orchids. It doesn't get flavour from the orchids. It's the texture that comes from the orchids. And it's so thick that you have to eat it with a knife and fork. And this is a very traditional um, food in these countries, but also it's, it's gaining in popularity now as well. So people uh, are increasingly seeking it out. And the sustainability of this trade is, is difficult to assess. Uh, I don't think, as far as I know, there's any cultivated um, source of this. I know lots of people are trying to cultivate it. I don't know. Think, I think anyone's been successful yet. 
but the the demand for it is is quite large and people are harvesting a lot of wild orchids and i know there is some great work going on at the moment um, looking at the sustainability of that and there are lots of other examples of orchids being used for food as well there's also jacanda um, in zambia and in, in neighboring countries as well which is another terrestrial um well several terrestrial orchid species which have their tubers ground to make a kind of cake so this is something that is, is happening in lots of places and it's a really important um, food product for consumers. So we really need to be thinking of ways to, um, to assess and then uh, and improve the sustainability of this. So I'm going to move on to medicine now. Orchids are used in medicine in lots and lots of different places. I work a lot, um, my day job, which isn't about orchids, but I work in China a lot. So a lot of my pictures are from China. This is a screenshot from the traditional Chinese medicine pharmacopoeia. I think it's the most recent one. I think it's the 2020 version. Um, I'm doing a project looking at the use of different species over time in the traditional Chinese medicine pharmacopoeia and orchids are, are some of the species that I'm looking at. But from this version, you can see there are three species there. Um, and these are used for shahu, which is uh, the canes of the dendrobium plant are dried and usually in the, the, the right hand picture here, you can see they're kind of coiled around into these little um, tiny, really tight coils. And then they're used to, for, for tea and um, for other kind of preparations and decoctions. They can also be sold in bundles of these canes as well. Now, lots of dendrobium, there's also a uh, gastrodia alata is also used a lot in traditional Chinese medicine and several other orchids too. But both of these gastrodia alata and dendrobium uh, Nobile and lots of other dendrobium species are cultivated on a really large scale in China for the trade. However, we do know that there is also wild collection and that wild harvesting can be um, very large scale and can be quite detrimental um, to populations, not just in China, but in neighbouring countries as well, because this is often an international trade. So um, I know there's lots and lots of work going on in looking at the sustainability of medicinal um, orchid harvest, uh, but I think we're still at a point now where sometimes we don't even know the species that are being used in, in medicines. And that's just such a big challenge for any product that's um, a derivative product where you can't identify the species at the end from just looking at it. So I, I think that's a big problem for, for medicinal orchid trade and for enforcing things like CITES for medicinal orchid products. So um, the kind of last main group I'm going to talk about is the ornamental orchid trade. I did my PhD on ornamental orchids, so this is potentially the one I know the most about. People just love orchids and they just love growing orchids. The hobbyists that I've spoken to in so many different countries, I, I worked in, um, in the UK, I worked in lots of other European countries, in Australia as well, in Japan. People just all talk about their love for orchids and it's so similar the way they talk about it, the, the beauty of them, the um, kind of intricate flowers, the, the rarity. Rarity is, is a really big thing for hobbyist collectors. People like to have something that other people don't have. They like to have something that isn't in their collection yet and maybe isn't in the collection of anybody that they know. And that means when a new species comes into the market, it can be really, um, really popular very, very quickly. So. Often uh, when a new species is described, if its location is revealed, collectors will go out to try and find that species and often they will be collected in huge numbers. And this can be, uh, this can be a big um, threat to wild populations. So these pictures are from various places. Again, um, on the, the left and the right here, these are pictures from China and um, they're from street markets showing lots of different orchids for sale. I like the one on the left because you have a big cart of um, artificially propagated Phalaenopsis at the back and then these wild harvested plants from uh, Yunnan province at the front and they're being sold basically next to each other and that's a kind of a big feature that you see often the um, artificially propagated and wild plants will be sold in the same stall. So consumers coming along there might have a choice of lots and lots of different plants and they might not necessarily know which ones are wild and which ones are cultivated and um, Stefan Gale at Kaduri led a really interesting paper a couple of years ago which I collaborated on looking at these markets in China and looking at um, which species were for sale and and yeah kind of confirmed that lots of often there were lots of artificially propagated plants on sale next to these wild plants and so the ornamental market is just so interesting because you have all this kind of rich uh, 
cultural history as well in terms of you know orchids have been grown for thousands of years as ornamental plants but also in in Europe especially you have this kind of orchid delirium thing from Victorian times where people were just so obsessed and that obsession is kind of still holding now um, and uh, and you can find out lots about these uh, about ornamental orchid trade through various different ways so talking to hobbyists going to orchid shows orchid shows are such an amazing place to find um, you know which species are, are currently in demand which species are winning prizes stuff like that so it's, it's a really interesting area to, to find out more about I'm, I'm just going to end by saying there are lots of other uses of orchids as well so some like the cosmetic industry often will uh, use lots of different orchids and, and, and feature them prominently in their marketing as well. This is a picture I took in a, an airport and some of these products are over a thousand pounds, uh, UK pounds, and this just it's just such high end product. And I mean, these are artificially propagated orchids, but um, but it's really interesting to look into why they're being included in these products and kind of the properties they're bringing to them. These two others, the middle and the right, these two are um, sort of developments of the traditional Chinese medicine dendrobium orchid use. So the middle one is a supplement, a dietary supplement for bodybuilders and weightlifters, and it's using dendrobium. And if you look at a lot of the marketing on the websites for these products, they talk about this kind of medicinal use that's always been around and it gives you energy and it and it helps you build muscle and things like this. On the right, I went to a function in China and they were serving dendrobium juice and dendrobium biscuits. So these are new products, but using that medicinal um, kind of health giving uh, marketing around them. So I think it's really interesting how how orchid products are now moving into these new markets and new consumers, but often kind of based on these these older uses. OK, I'm going to briefly move on to future priorities. So I think um, we have lots still to do on the orchid trade. There are lots of species still being traded. There are lots of uh, wild populations still being threatened by trade. And I think one of the biggest things is we don't even know which species are being traded most of the time. For some things like medicines or uh, or salep, you often know what, which species are meant to be there, which species are meant to be used in these products because the recipes are often really old and um, written down and, and very clear. But it doesn't mean that new species can't be being brought into things. So, for example, in medicines, if um, if it's a derivative product, you, you often don't know if the right species are even in there. You don't know um, if, if someone's gone out and collected a load of dendrobiums for um, the medicinal trade. You might not be sure that they've collected the right ones. If the, the, the right orchid species, the target orchid species are, are collected, to local extinction, for example, then other species might be collected in their place as a kind of bycatch. And that's really interesting. And it means that we often don't know which species might potentially be threatened. The horticultural trade, the ornamental trade is just a nightmare because there are so many different species and new ones coming in all the time. So if we don't know the species in trade, we can't make sure that they uh, the trade is sustainable. We can't do things like red listing of species that are in trade to make sure that they're not threatened by trade. So finding out which species are in trade, I would say, is a number one priority. Another thing is to understand these trade chains, to understand the supply chains, who is involved, how orchids move from the wild to the end consumer. This is a figure from this paper uh, bottom right, the citation for it should be out any day now. This is led by Leanne Bullo again. A uh, master's student I worked with a couple of years ago, she went to Vietnam and she looked at um, orchid trade chains coming from forested areas, so kind of local trade chains. These should, in theory, be quite simple. They're coming from the forest to people who live near the forest or, or not very far away. But she found there were quite a lot of different actors within the supply chains. The orchids were moving through lots of different um, types of people, so people who uh, sell them, people who harvest them, and then they maybe move on to orchid nurseries or farms and then move on again to consumers, and that there were some links with international trade. Now, if this is just a, a small local supply chain, then these international supply chains are likely to be much more complex. 
And I think we just need a better understanding of how these things are moving around. Otherwise, we'll just never really understand how illegal plants are getting uh, out of countries and to international consumers or even to local consumers, too. And it also gives us an idea of some of the people who we might be able to, to speak to to better understand the trade and to also maybe engage them with orchid uh, conservation a bit more. And that's my final point. I think we really need to understand why people are buying wild orchids, especially when there are artificially propagated orchids available too. And I do think that they have such an important role to play in orchid conservation. Often orchid hobbyists, especially ornamental um, orchid hobbyists, they will have such a good idea about how to grow these plants. <clears throat> they will also have a really good um, idea of where plants may be coming from. And um, they'll also have potentially great collections that could be used in ex situ work. And as you can see from these quotes, which is, is from this paper um, I published quite a few years ago now, orchid hobbyists often really hate CITES and they're, they're sometimes really distrustful of conservation. And we need to find a way around that and we need to find a way to, to work together more so that we can bring everybody who loves orchids together to try and make sure that they don't go extinct due to over harvesting for trade. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will take some questions now, thank you.